Hi, I'm Dagmar, and I'm a narrative designer and writer since 2016. Uh, I'm co-founder of the Belgian studio Like Charlie. So I didn't grow up playing games. Um, I watched movies all the time. And I thought I was going to be a screenwriter. I was wrong. I am a game writer. And I love making games. I love writing their narratives, and I love collaborating on them with other game developers. Um, so this is us, like Charlie. Like Charlie, that's me and Kenny. Uh, we are a artist and a writer, and together we create stories. We love the same stories, and uh, we, our, our arts, our creations, they're like, they fit together. They're like, you know, yin and yang, and they love to be unified. And together we made uh, Mary's Room. We intended it to be a portfolio work. Uh, we were just gonna release it on Steam for free and then hopefully get hired afterwards. But we received so, so much positive response that um, we understood we, we weren't done working together. It was a great collaboration, we were gonna do it again. So we founded our own studio last September 2018 and we were gonna make another game, we were gonna do it again. Um, but we needed help. So we now have a programmer, a producer, and two sound designers, and a community manager and marketing manager. And we're making Ghost on the Shore. It's still very early in development, and the early demo is available here in the expo space. So this session is a personal testimony. It's my personal discovery of the narrative possibilities of games, as opposed to film or books. It is a, a testimony of my first experience as an independent game developer, a narrative designer, and writer. So I what I want to do is uh, share my approach to story and character uh, with my background in screenwriting and how I learned to adapt my dramatic strategies to story development for video games more specifically. So to me, everything is story and everything starts with the character. When I boldly state that everything starts with the character, I don't mean that, it, that that is necessarily the first thing that we do uh, when developing a game. Marie's room started with a room. Um, it was a room that Kenny had been working on for more than a year before he even asked me to take a look at it and see if we could turn it into an actual game. But at Like Charlie, we tell stories through a gaming experience, and stories are about character. Uh, characters are the reason that we watch, read, or play, and why we keep at it. So we may not remember the story from modern times or all the quests in Uncharted or what the Philosopher's Stone did exactly, but we all know Charlie Chaplin, uh, Nathan Drake, and Harry Potter. And through them, we get to tell our story. So they deserve a little of our attention. I'm a firm believer in emotional storytelling. An audience is more attentive when they are invested in the characters. So you need to find that hook into your character, into their portrayal, with a specific and you need to find out what is specific about them, what makes them stand out so that people can relate to those characters. Whether they're hilariously awkward, cute, funny, scary as hell, or just incredibly strong and handsome, you need to find that specific quality for your character for people to relate to, the, to it. And yes, we have great gaming experiences, uh, you know, they're, they're without any story or without characters, uh, but they're just, they're games, they're not trying to tell a story. To tell a story fully, you need the player to be emotionally involved, and you do that through character. So as writers and creators of narrative games, we need to dig deep to uncover everything there is to know about the characters, both Avatar and NPC. That's what I like to do before I start even writing. I just take all of my characters out for a glass of wine, or coffee, that works too, and we just talk, and they tell me everything, and I write it all down, everything that they tell me, also everything that they're trying to hide from me. And it's a big mess. It's a mess of notebooks and Pinterest pages and digital documents, but I need that mess to distill from that um, their personalities so that I get to understand them, so that I know how they're going to respond in certain situations. Because when you create characters of flesh and blood, um, people will respond to it in a more visceral and emotional way. So which brings us to emotional storytelling which happens through identification, social emotional responses to familiar or universal behavior of characters. And that social emotional response to that familiar behavior is very personal. You know, every person reacts differently. Yet it is my job to find those universal triggers so that everybody will respond to it in some way. 
Uh, those triggers can be language, uh, words, objects, music. Uh, in the case of Marie's room, um, where you play as Kelsey, the second character, I needed to find those objects and those story events that would trigger a response in as many people as possible so that players would identify with her, with Kelsey, um, thus creating empathy, hopefully understanding, and in the case of Kelsey, even some forgiveness. So this is true for all medium, media, uh, uh, film, books, but in games, we can take it a little step further um, because a player has a direct personal impact on the events they witness because of meaningful choice. And this is the reason why games are a perfect medium to tell emerging emotional stories, because of meaningful choice. Now in Marie's room, those, the choices that we gave our player were limited. Uh, they had less impact because the story was defined beforehand. I mean, you had the freedom to explore the room at your own pace, but you could not influence the outcome. Um, the conflict that arose in the story did not come from your personal, personal actions. I would like you guys to show you the trailer now. It was supposed to be simple. Get in, get out. I should have known better. Just get the journal, Kelsey. That's what they said, that there wasn't much time. She only needed the journal. There's no such thing as food waste. And don't I know it. The smell of garbage will be in my nose forever, and the taste of it in my mouth. I swore I would never be that hungry again. I didn't care what it took. And then there was the science project. They paired me with her, of all people. She wouldn't stop talking about time travel and black holes and shit. So we decided to do antimatter. Who does a high school science project on antimatter? She asked me why I was so angry all the time. And I told her because it's a dirty deal. It's Russian roulette and utterly unfair. The cards had been dealt. Any player would have passed. I chose to be angry instead. But Marie, my friend Marie, she got me a new deck and suggested that I deal again. She once asked me, don't you ever dream, Kelsey? And I said, I don't. I don't dream. I plan. What I didn't tell her was that I wouldn't allow anyone to mess with those plans. No one. That's Marie's room. Um, and the freedom that we gave the player here was to explore that room at his own pace, pick up the objects that he wanted to, and relate to it the way that he wanted to, which did create some sense of involvement with the story. Uh, people felt very close to what was happening in that one room. Uh, but we think if you, if you design game mechanics uh, where you let the player make a meaningful choice and influence the outcome of what's happening, you create an even bigger attachment to the characters and the events. Because then you create those emotions that are unique to games, namely responsibility and guilt, pride and triumph. That's only because of your personal actions that you get to experience that. A film, a book will never do that. And so this is what we're going to work with or are working with uh, for Ghost on the Shore. But back to the emotional experience in Marie's room. Though we didn't realize it at the time, we were making a game. We did create that. We created an emotional experience. And um, the feedback that we got, the response was overwhelming. And we were really surprised by it. So reviewers and content creators, the sense of having been somewhere, known some people, understood another's tale. We loved feedback like that. Jacksepticeye went quiet for a bit. a little sweet ending to it. Well done! That took a way different twist than I thought it was going to. So we thought if you can shut up Jacksepticeye for a second, you must have done something right, right? 
Um, and then there was the response on our page, our Steam page. Um, people were emotionally involved. I mean, most of them loved it. <laughs> most of them loved it, not all of them. Some even hated Kelsey, like uh, thought she was the worst friend in the world and uh, she had committed an unforgivable act. But I thought like even those players who hated her, they were emotionally involved enough to care, to care about what happened on the screen. So we loved reading those discussions. And then of course, there's the personal encounters when you watch people play your game. And you get to see the emotions on their faces. Uh, we will never forget that one guy who after playing um, felt like he, could, he congratulated us and then said he couldn't talk to us because you know, he had to like recover from the, his words, gut-wrenching experience. And we felt so proud. So um, how did that happen then? I mean, how could a game that I created from my heart, from my gut, create such an emotional response? I needed to understand how that happened if I wanted to do it again with Ghosts on the Shore. So inspired by Catherine Isbister's How Games Move Us, I took a closer look at Marie's room, and I would like to share this with you guys today. So back at the day when we made Marie's room, there was only two people. Uh, Kenny and I, an artist and a writer, and we just had to manage with the time and tools that we had. And with the help from our friends and family who did the music, the voice acting, the testing. So what tools did I as a narrative designer have to convey the story? So environment, dialogue and VO, music, and together they could work with the right game mechanics. So to allow for an emotional bond, the player has to allow emotions to run free. An environment plays a key role here. This is why Kenny's 3D art and my raw emotional stories work so well together, is because he creates places that are beautiful. It's a place that you want to be. Even the music enhances that. Um, and you feel comfortable, you feel relaxed. Uh, and that's when the characters enter the stage and deliver you their story, their testimonies. And it's then that you, that you are open for the story and you understand you let it in and you experience it. Because if you brace for impact for a certain story that you're expecting, um, your shutters are down and nothing comes in. So, I was used to writing screenplays for TV and film. And what I personally had to focus on was the player. Because that was the one thing that you didn't have in film and movies, um, that player interfering with my story. But I, was writing, I wasn't writing a story now, was I? I was writing a game. So how could I preserve the characters, which I value so much, their flaws and strengths, their arcs, without them taking up too much space? Because you needed some space for the player. Because ultimately what we're doing is we're creating a gaming experience for a player with him at the wheel. So first thing that I needed to do was explore the room. While I was exploring it, um, I wanted to define the person who inhabited it, Marie. I did get some sense of her because Kenny had already designed a fair share of her personal belongings. By why would Marie turn her own room upside down? Why would she be astonished, touched by all the things she's discovering? I mean, she knows them, it's her own things. I thought that if I would have Marie explore the room, that it would feel more like exposition, like something that we were doing for the player. Um, and it would, I would not be creating a character portrayal, just exposition. So that was my first clear narrative choice. I needed a second character, Kelsey. I also needed a reason for Kelsey to want to turn the room upside down, and I needed also a reason for the player to be in that room. What was his goal? Uh, so I needed conflict. And that was my second narrative choice. Um, the person, Marie, would be absent from the scene, and the player's goal would be to figure out what happened to her. Kelsey's goal was harder. She already knew what had happened to Marie. She'd been there, she was part of it. Uh, and that was, that was kind of a challenge because my character knew more than that the player would, yet the player is playing with the character Kelsey. So why then would Kelsey be searching the room for clues? Why would she search the room at all? Why is she there? The answer came when Kenny started designing the journal. Kelsey would come back for the journal the journal that Marie had left intentionally all those years ago, and she herself could not bring herself to enter that room again because of something traumatic that happened there uh, 20 years ago. When Kelsey picks up the journal, the memories come flooding back. 
So the room, Marie's room, is how Kelsey remembers it all, and the journal that bears witness to how Marie experienced it back at the time. So the story. What story was I going to tell? For me, inspiration comes from everyday life. I like to travel, call myself an adventurer, and um, you know, it, it's my mission to uncover stories throughout the world. I see myself as an archeologist, an anthropologist, an archivist, and very often, life people, events, or locations will be the spark that triggers a new project. And always will snippets of real life uh, find its way into my work, whatever project I'm working on. And Marie's room started with a newspaper article that I'd read um, about some kids in American high school where children, uh, high school children, were um, starving. Uh, right under the noses of their teachers and their friends. They were hungry, there was no food at home, uh, not for breakfast, not for dinner, there was nothing to take to school for lunch, and they would steal lunches from other kids. Because of embarrassment, they didn't share it with anyone, not with friends, not with teachers. And that just was mind-boggling. How can kids, right under our noses, be starving to death? And how must, what must that be like, you know, if you're hungry and you're embarrassed? Um, what would a high school girl do to stop being hungry? To survive, really? What strategies would she employ? How desperate, desperate could she get? And could it drive her to extreme measures? Because hunger is such an overwhelming feeling, you know, implying a wide set of emotions that come with it. Embarrassment especially is very, um, a very destructive emotion. So I wanted to play with that. Uh, could, could it destroy a friendship, a strong bond, family? Could it drive you to hate someone? And was there a way back from it? Um, so I decided to use this backstory for Kelsey, and Kelsey that would then become this fierce and determined person, which is the exact opposite of who Marie was, uh, the romantic, open-hearted girl, uh, and that's a beautiful conflict to work with. I never intended the story uh, or the game to have a social impact, yet that's what happened. We received the award in Brazil for... Uh, social impact for social matters. I just wanted to tell a gripping story about a character that I loved, that I cared about. But somehow that exact, that's exactly what happened. And I love that characters and stories and events, that they grow up and they become their own things. You know, they get their own lives. So that's the story. Now we're making a game. I, I have this whole story set out for both characters. How was I going to fit all of that into one room with objects? So the tools I had were the objects, the character's words, and a voice. So I needed to chop up my narrative uh, into smaller chunks. I made a beat sheet, um, and I, um, every beat got its own object. Like the objects got like post-its almost on them with a beat of the story. And I incorporated as many of the objects that Kenny had already made, but um, we needed also more specific objects. Now, did all objects in the room need to be found? We didn't think so, because we didn't want it to feel like a tedious assignment. Um, yet certain story beats in the story needed to be conveyed to the player, or the story wouldn't make sense, and we would only confuse the player. Um, so we thought, what if we created different levels for each story beat, with a certain object that needed to be found, and a puzzle attached to it, that you had to solve before getting to the next level? That could work. But we had just one room. Could we ask people to search that same room over and over again? This was a computer. We had a computer, password protected, and we knew that with a specific goal, the player searched the room more intently. If you get the password, you get to open the computer. So we wanted to repeat that. We wanted to broaden that. We needed a specific goal for the player to search the room. We already had a narrative goal what happened to Marie. So how could we tie that narrative goal into the gameplay, the goal of the gameplay, of actually playing the game? We decided on a lock. Not a key, but a puzzle you had to solve. Five-figure combination. Uh, and the numbers were hidden somewhere in the room. Now, all objects in the room were free to interact with. You could choose whether you would handle, uh, uh, interact with them or not. Um, so we needed some reflection of it somewhere in the game for some sense of progression, like how many objects have you found? How far along are you? And Kenny uh, loved the idea of using the journal for it because we didn't want an inventory. Um, 
So every object that you find has a reflection in the journal uh, of Marie. So if you would go through the journal, you could see where there were empty spots, if there were many objects you had to find or not. At the same time, there would be like a timeline at the bottom um, where, with the marking of each chapter and date on that timeline. So giving the player the freedom to explore the room at his own pace, that still felt like the right choice, but how could we guarantee that the player would get the whole story without being confused? So we came up with the following. Remember the five numbers to the padlock? We put them on objects in the room, and every object, those five objects would be mandatory, and they would each hold a vital piece of the story. I wrote it so that even if you found those five objects without any of the optional ones, you'd still get the story. Even if you just found four and you guessed the fifth digit, you'd still get the story. When th this is the climax scene that's unlocked after you uh, solve the puzzle. Of course, I mean, if you, just, if you just find those five objects, you miss the whole narrative experience, but ultimately that's up to the player. So I wanted the objects to be specific and meaningful to either Marie or Kelsey or preferably both. Um, and that brought up the issue of Marie's voice. Kelsey, Kelsey was present in the room. I mean, every object triggered her voice. But what about Marie? So I needed to use the diary to convey her opinion, her story. I mean, their opinions and their experience, they could differ. They con could contradict even. I realized that it didn't have to be the same thing. This would deliver conflict, because you have uh, Marie's experience, you have Kelsey's experience. And I loved that conflict so much that I wanted to enlarge it. So that's when I made Kelsey a grown woman, reminiscing about the past. I liked that she had time to grow up and reflect upon her childhood, um, think about the things she's done, come to terms with it, uh, maybe atone for them even. So you have the adult Kelsey reminiscing about the past, reflecting on it, and the instant uh, experience of teenage Marie in the journal. So a player could still choose to stick with Kelsey and not read the pages, but we were hoping that this uh, clash of stories, of narrative, would stimulate a player to read the journal. So we loved creating Marie's room, no matter how hard it was sometimes. And so we are very lucky that we get to do it again. Uh, with everything we learned from Marie's room, we're now working on our debut commercial title, Ghost on the Shore. We're still early in development, so I don't want to talk about it too much yet, because we're searching for a lot of things still. But I'll tell you quickly the story. It's about Riley, a woman who escapes her old world by buying a second-hand boat and just hitting the high seas until there's a storm. It takes her to the islands. And on these islands, she encounters the ghost of Josh, who gets stuck in her head, uh, trapped inside her head. And um, she won't be able to uh, move on until she helps him remember his life, his death, uh, on these islands. I do want to share how the project started. Um, Ghost on the Shore was a dream of me having died. And I was in that dream, I was still roaming around in the house, uh, trying to get into contact with the people I'd left behind, the people that I loved. But the feeling of not being able to reach them anymore, that was, there was something that stuck with me after I woke up and for a long time after. And then I came across the um, trailer for Jamie Marks is Dead. And the tagline says, how far would you go to be remembered? And I thought that's so strong, another very strong emotion, because don't we all want to be seen? So this was the thing where we started with Ghost on the Shore. Again, it will be uh, an emotional narrative experience. But this time, we're going to take it a step further. So we still want the player to have a lot of freedom. And he's going to be able to make, or she, uh, valuable, show, uh, meaningful choices, um, because he, in the dialogues, you get options, you get to choose ones, so your choices are irrevocable, um, and those choices influence the relationship the player, Riley, is developing with Josh, the ghost inside her head. Um, and by determining which relationship they're having, you're also determining um, the narrative lines. So by choosing choosing certain options in the dialogue, you're determining what's happening in the game. Well, both our games are right outside there. If you play Ghost on the Shore, uh, please send us any feedback you have. We're still early in development and uh, value any feedback you have. Thank you.